Again, good morning, everyone. So good to see you today. Why don't you just look at somebody next to you and say, I'm glad you made it. Hallelujah. Hey, just a couple quick announcements. Don't forget uh, our prayer services will be starting back up, not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, which will be August the 10th. We'll start our prayer services back up beginning at 630. Uh, that really is, that's the, that's the engine of the train right there. And so what happens in our prayer meetings is really determines what happens in the life of the church. So you can just join us in that from 6.30 to 7.30. It's just a one-hour prayer meeting, but we do worship and we pray. And we just seek the face of God. So just that's coming up not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Amen. And you know what? Just a couple things. The uh, You know, th we just got out of July. Today's August the 1st. And, um, man, we had, an, a we had a tremendous financial breakthrough in July. Okay, okay, thank all three of y'all. I'm telling you, it was really, I mean, we had, you know, our advance to calls giving, we've given up to nearly $11,000 through the month of July. $11,000. And uh, I've been in touch with the bank, and we've been working together. I, I sort of threw the whole vision on them last week. And uh, another thing we're getting ready to do, talked to Dr. Carroll the other day, uh, this, this, Almost two acres of the old Sunny's property over here. We're fixing to roll that over into the church. That's fixing to come over here. And we're beginning to pay down, you know, uh, all this money that's coming in for advanced calls. We're just sending it out now. We're, we, we'll begin this week. We'll start sending it out weekly. We just begin to reduce the, the principal there. And so we just believe by the time we get in 20 months, that was our goal, everything on our property is going to be debt free. Amen. So we're excited about that. That's already in the works. That's already beginning. Uh, Jesse and the school and all that, that's going to be debt-free in about another six months. All that's going to be debt-free. All of our school buildings are going to be paid for. Amen. So we're just moving. Y'all know it's not a money issue. It's, it's about an expansion issue. God's allowing us to expand the borders. And so we just thank God for that. Amen. So don't forget, coming up September the 12th will be our major... Uh, First offering for advance to calls, we'll re receive a special offering that day. Many of you are giving as we go, and, and just continue to do that. Whatever works best for you, you can give weekly, you can give monthly, whatever you want to do, but just continue to give, or we'll receive a special offering on that day. And we have five of those for the next 20 months, and we just believe by the end of all that, God's going to bless it and honor it. Amen? I believe. Well, let me just give you one more thing real quick. Uh, We've got some transitions going on in people's lives right here. Uh, sitting on the front row is Christopher Hutchinson. Here he is. Amen. He was on the drums this morning. And uh, he, he's, uh, he's making a transition to move here for the next season in his life. Amen. Chris, why don't you just stand up and wave to everybody. I know you've been here before. Yeah. So we're excited about that. And right behind him is his parents. That's his mom, Angie. And his stepdad, Hugh, right there. Will you guys just kind of wave to everybody? These guys, like, like tracked with him all the way down and got him down here along with Porter. And, uh, and so now he's making this transition. He's just going to be here for the next season of his life and what God is saying. And uh, I was just talking to uh, Angie and Hugh there. And I, it's a big privilege for us to give stewardship and people to entrust us with people's destinies and callings and things like that. And so it says a lot about the parents that's willing to let their children go. Karen and I know that. We, when, when we watched Vanessa go to South Africa, like right after she graduated, I thought, my Lord, I might as well be gutted. I felt like my guts were coming out, you know. But, it's, but, but you know, God does what he does in people's lives. And so, Christopher, we're excited about the next journey of your life. And for this season, he's going to be working with our Harvest Academy schools. He's going to be starting there. He's going to be plugged into that while, while he's here. And so we're just excited about what God is doing. God said to us many years ago that people will move from the north to south, the east and the west, just to become part of this ministry in this house for a season. And then they would, they would go and they'd be planted back out to other places. And we just believe we're in the throes of that. Amen. Hallelujah. So God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for entrusting us. Amen. We love Christopher. Well, I've already known him. He's been here multiple times, so we just got a great relationship, and I appreciate that. All right, stand to your feet. Let's, let's jump into the Word. We only got like, like 32 minutes left before that magic hour hits. 
All right. How many are ready for the word this morning? Amen. Come on, go with me to our, our theme verses here. This will be just a continuation of the series, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel 47. I'm going to preach real hard, real fast. So listen hard and listen real fast, all right? So we can get through where we need to get through today and get to where we're going. Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, Ezekiel chapter 47, verse number 1 says, Then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, the water was flowing from under the threshold of the house towards the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under from the right side of the house, from the south side of the altar. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate, and he led me around on the outside to the outer gate by the way of the gate that faces east. And behold, the water was trickling from the south side. And when a man went out, went towards the east with a line in his hand, he measured it a thousand cubits, and he led me through the water, water reaching the ankles. And again he measured a thousand, and he led me through the water, water reaching the knees. And again he measured, and he led me through the water, and it's water reaching the loins or the waist. Verse number five. And again he measured, and it was a river that I could not ford or cross, for the water had risen. Enough water to swim in, a river that could not be forded, or a river that could not be crossed. I'm just trying to say to you, the water's going to get deep around here. And he said to me, son of man, Maybe you may have seen this, but then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, on the bank of the river, there were very many trees on the one side and on the other. And then he said to me, these waters go out towards the eastern region, and they go down into the Arabah. Then they go towards the sea, being made to flow into the sea, and the waters of the sea become fresh. It's the same word for healed. So the waters of the sea become healed. And it came about that every living creature that swarms in every place where the river goes will live. And, and there will be very many fish of these waters that go there and many others to become fresh. So everything will live wherever the river goes. And it will come about that fishermen will stand beside it from Engedi to England. And there, will be a, there will be a place for the spreading of nets and the fish will be according to their kinds like the fish of the great sea very many and its swamps and its marshes will not become fresh for they will be left for salt and by the river on its bank one on one side one on the other will grow all kinds of trees for food and the leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail they will bear fruit every month because the waters flow from the sanctuary or we could say the waters are flowing through the church and the fruit will be there for food and leaves for healing notice that when the water began to flow out of the sanctuary when it began to flow from the temple everywhere that water went it even made its way into the dead sea but everywhere that water went things began to live again I'm just prophesying over your life and over this region, things are about to come alive again. Now look with me in our, sort of our theme. This is our theme verse. I just want to keep putting it in your hearing. Psalms 85. Psalms 85, verse number 6. Will you not yourself revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? He said, revive us again. Same word for bring us back to life. Revive us again. That's what we've been talking about. This is a part four of a series of messages that I've titled simply, Revive Us Again. Come on, will you push on about three people and tell them the Lord's going to do it again? Come on, just tell them the Lord's going to do it again. Come on, I need some faith to rise up in this place today. All the vacationers need to come off a of vacation. Let faith rise. The Lord's going to revive us again, again. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray. Father, thank you today for the precious and power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you today for what you're going to do in this place and the lives of those that are listening, those that, have, that are sitting here live, and those that have joined on by the way of Facebook and those that are listening. Lord, we thank you today. Holy Spirit, you're the preacher. You're the teacher. You're the communicator and the revealer of all truth. Thank you today for what you're going to do in the hearts of men and, men and women's lives that are represented in your presence today. 
thank you today, Jesus, in advance for the breakthrough. Thank you in advance today for what you're going to do in hearts. And we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Now, in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody together said amen. Amen and amen. God bless you this morning. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. In our text today, as we've been talking to you about over the last several weeks, Ezekiel gets this vision of water that's flowing from the east side of the threshold of the temple. It's literally flowing out from the temple or the sanctuary, what we would call the churches in our modern day language. And it began with a trickle. That's how it began. And it began to trickle out from the sanctuary, but the further it went, it dramatically began to increase in its depth about every third of a mile. The further the water went out, the deeper it got. The river is his vision. This, this is what he's, he's seeing. The river in his vision flowed literally all the way down to the Red Sea. And when it got to the Red Sea, miraculously, everything in the Red Sea began to live again. We know now, since we've been on this journey in this particular series, that water is often tied to the work or the moving of the Holy Spirit. So the river, in his vision, the Holy Spirit, in his vision, is ultimately the future evidence of the Spirit of God that has returned to his sanctuary and that spirit, that river, now is flowing into the land. It's a picture. It's, it's a word picture. It's a lesson on how the church should be modeling the kingdom's way of life. The further we go with God, the deeper we should be in God. Uh, the, the, the more God moves through us and the further along we go, the deeper the life of Christ becomes manifested in our life. Uh, the, 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 and I, like, I like to say it this way. The closer you get to God, the more you know God. And the more you know God, the less he lets you get away with. So in the Christian walk, there ought to be this life of Christ being a work that's being deepened on the inside of us. It started out about ankle deep, but by the time that river got to where it was going, it was waters to swim in. That's the picture of the Christian life that with the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, the further we go with God, the deeper he becomes in our life. So the book of Ezekiel comes to us about a nation now. I'm going to get to where I'm going. Just let me work it out a little bit. It comes to us, the whole book of Ezekiel comes to us about a nation that is in decline. It's a nation that's declining both spiritually, governmentally, and in their families. There is a decline that's happening in the nation. And part of it is because God's designated spheres of authority in his kingdom, which was the church, the government, and the families were in a decline. And, the, and, and they were in a decline because they no longer held to the statutes or the commandments of God. And so when they began to reject God, the nation began to get into a decline. And when the nation began to reject God spiritually, governmentally, and in their families, they begin to rule out the statutes and the commandments of God. Now you have a nation in chaos. Now you have a nation in decline. So God begins to speak to Ezekiel. When, be, before, before they left Jerusalem and, and the whole Babylonian invasion came, when Ezekiel was in Jerusalem, he was a priest. By the time he's exiled into Babylon, he becomes a prophet. And there's a difference between the role of a priest and the role of a prophet. So God speaks to him in Babylon. God speaks to him in the chaos. God speaks to him in the worst decline at that particular time in the nation's history. And God begins to speak to him because God always starts with his people first. 
God always starts at his house first. The reason why the nation was in decline was because God's house was in decline. And long before we can address the courthouse, long before we can address the White House, we got to deal with God's house. Long before we start making decrees over the land and governments and authorities out there, we better make sure that the authorities in here are operating according to the commandments of God. Because God always comes to his house first. Ezekiel's message, I'm, I'm just a little bit of groundwork because I'm just trying to make sure everybody is on the same page. I'm just going to work through it real fast. Ezekiel's message comes to the remnant that's left in Judah who is a demoralized bunch of people who are exiled and they are living now in a Babylonian culture. The temple had been burned by fire. The, the monarch of God, the, the, the thing that they, 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 they prided themselves on was Jehovah God, the monarch, was over. The city of David laid in ruins and the temple was no more. In the theme of Ezekiel's message, he begins, he's not coming to them as a priest now. He's not, he's not coming to them to shepherd them. He's coming to them to prophesy to them. He's coming to let them know that you don't have to stay like this if we can get it right in here. So he's coming with a message, and that, a message that he comes with, the whole theme of his message throughout the book of Ezekiel is that for each individual began to take on a moral responsibility for the national calamity that's going on in the land. Now, I know that's a lot to say to some good-looking people out here today, but ladies and gentlemen, we cannot throw stones at the condition of our land until we first fix the condition that's in the house of God. Because the condition of the land has never mattered to God. As long as God's house is always right, then God's house can always fix the condition that's in the land. Amen. Talk to me up in here. And that's what Ezekiel's message was. He said, I, I'm, I'm not prophesying to the Babylonians. I'm not prophesying to their culture. I'm prophesying to the people of God. I'm prophesying to the remnant of Judah. Because if we can get our act together, what we have been surrounded by, what we have been in, in thrusted into makes no bearings on the power of God because God can move by little or by much. It makes no difference to him. He just needs a people that's walking in step with the movements of God. That's why we need to be saying in our congregation day, Lord, revive us again. Lord, move in our hearts again so that we can take authority over the land again. So here's the point now because it, every individual is responsible for their own sin. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know we, in most churches today we got to be careful because a lot of people don't talk about sin no more. Because we don't want to offend nobody. We don't want nobody to be called out. But ladies and gentlemen, sin is what's wrong with the world. And, and we don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with sin that's in the world. I have a problem with the sin that's in the camp, in the church. Because if the church is ever going to be a witness to the world, there's got to be a distinction about the walk that's in the house versus the walk that's out there. So he begins to deal with them and begin to take responsibility for the individual sin because the weight now, the weight of the collective sin of the entire nation, of every individual has contributed to the downfall of the nation. It has contributed to them breaking their covenant. They broke their covenant with God. Israel broke their covenant with God. Now they're living in exile. Now they're living surrounded by enemies. They're living in a land that God never intended them to live in. So here's the point. Until we as the people of God, is this all right? I'm going to preach in a minute. Until we as the people of God get the agenda of the kingdom's priorities in order, the order of the culture will always be chaos. So that's why First Peter says judgment always begins first in the house of the Lord. 
So before we can point at everybody else's sin, we have to take responsibility for our own sin in the house of God. And we have to begin to say, God, where did we miss it? Lord, where did we blow it? Lord, how far have we traveled away from you? Why is this calamity on us? Why is the nation in chaos? Because as I told you last week, when you live in a nation that proclaims 70% of the population proclaim that they are born again believers and you live in a nation of chaos, there has to be an inventory taken on the church that's in the nation because the nation is a reflection of the church. And it just goes to show if the church was in charge, what would the nation look like? Amen. Amen. So, 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 so until we can get the water, huh, the river, moving down the aisles of our churches, we can't get it moving down the aisles of our streets. Until we can get the water moving and the evidence of God's presence in our churches We'll never have the evidence or the presence of God manifested in our nation. That's why even when you come in here today, I was looking around again. I've been, I've been calling you out in my own heart. I'm looking around. I'm saying, how come people are not pressing in and we're trying to get the river to rise? We've been on this message for four weeks now. How come we can't get any deeper than ankle deep? How come we just stuck on ankle deep water? There ought to be enough water to swim in. There ought to be enough power and manifestation of the Holy Ghost that people are dying diving into it and they are swimming in. You can come in here broken but leave fixed. You can come in here diseased but leave healed because it's the water that's trying to flow through the temple and here we are sitting in the greatest nation on the planet and we don't have no restrictions with our worship. We don't have no restrictions even in our gatherings and we gather together and we sit like we ain't got no problem. We sit like everything's going to be all right and I'm trying to tell you everything ain't all right. It ain't the world's problem. It's the problem that's in the church and what we need. We don't need a move of God in the world. We need a move of God in the house of God. That's where we got to have it. That's why there's got to be this quickening and this awakening and this coming alive to the things of God. That's what the psalmist said. Lord, will you not revive us again? God, we don't want to stay stuck in this pattern. We don't want to stay held down in this bondage. We believe that there's a river that can flow out of the presence of the sanctuary of God and it begins to touch things and everything that was disconnected, dislocated, disjointed, and everything that was dead can become Come alive again. Push on somebody and tell them, revive us again. Revive us again. Revive us again. That's why the church has to be revived. See, see I'm going to work on it now. The, the, the answer to our culture, the answer to our culture. Now, just hang on to me, all you, all you real, real strong uh, polit politicians out there that, that, that get into all these political battles. The answer to our culture is not in more legislation. It's not in more equality. It's not in more reform. And all those things are good. Just let me qualify that. All those things are good and we need more of it. But listen, we've had good legislation. We've had all those things and it still didn't create revivals. Because revival don't come out of legislation. Revival comes out of the hearts of people. And so, so the depravity of our culture, watch me now. This is where we set it apart. The depravity in our culture is the result of sin. And only, we did it at communion, only Jesus can cleanse us of our sins. You can take all the therapy, all the counseling, and I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I'm all for everything that helps. I'm all for three steps, five steps, ten steps, twelve steps. Just keep on stepping. Just get it until you get it right. I'm all for the steps. I'm all for therapy and counseling. And I'm all for that. So I'm not, there's many people in here that serve in those places. I'm not against any of that. But at the end of the day, you cannot fix what's born of the human heart because you were born into sin. And only Jesus Christ can fix the sin of humanity. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can fix the sin. I, I think I told it to, 
uh, last week or whenever, when, when John the Baptist was in, was in Bethany just beyond the Jordan River, and he was actually in the Jordan baptizing people. He looked up over that hillside coming, and there comes Jesus. And I think it's in John 1, 29. He comes, here comes Jesus walking down that dusty hill, and he points at him. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what our world needs. It needs, every, it needs a movement of Christ coming back into the church where we understand that the problem out there is the result of the problem that's going on in here. And only the church, now watch this, Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 10. Only the church can manifest Jesus. The world can't do it. Mm -mm. Ephesians 3, 10 says, for the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So it's through the church that Jesus begins to get manifested. So if the church is not alive to the things of God, then the culture is going to stay dead to it. Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So part of the struggle now, this is where we're going. I only have a few minutes left. Part of our struggle is that the church, if we're not careful, and this is not for everybody, I know, but part of the problem, I'm just preaching, I'm, 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 I'm using buckshot today, all right? I'm not using a rifle, I'm shooting buckshot. It's just scattering out there everywhere. Part of the problem in the church continues to compromise the fundamental truths of our faith. And I got some scriptures to back it up. If we just had more time, I'd deal with it. But when you have churches like ours, evangelical believers that are questioning the authority of God's word, when they continue to question the firm absolutes and the standards of even biblical morality, and they no longer adhere to scripture, the water is drying up. Now, I know we got some young people in here, and they're going to say, boy, he's just old-fashioned. No, I'm just biblical. I'm not trying to be old-fashioned. I'm not trying to be, because I, I believe the Bible is relevant to every generation. So, so, so when the church embraces, watch this now, the sins of a culture, when the church begins to embrace the sins of a culture and we call it acceptable, there's no water flowing out of the sanctuary. The water is drying up. When, when the church loses its standards, talk to me now, when the church no longer has conviction because we have relegated the feeling of God to a feeling or the moves of God to a feeling and we have compromised the emotional realm of our being to identify with a culture that's lost and we try to water down the gospel, we try to water down the word of God for the sake of fitting into a culture. And once you do that, come on, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you give in, then you don't see the power of God manifested. But if you defy the powers of your day and say, if you throw me into the fire, then just throw me into the fire. But my God is able to deliver me. But even if he don't, we're still not going to bend, we're still not going to bow, but we're going to worship God, and we're going to worship God alone. We got to have a generation that gets back to the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that is the book for me. The purpose, now let me just, let me work this out, because when, when, when the church is believing the same as the culture, then you have to ask, where's the standard? <laughs> what did you get saved from? See, the purpose of doctrine, the reason why God gave us doctrine is so that we could teach, instruct, and tutor. That's the purpose of the word. Look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 3. Is this all right? Y'all getting quiet on me now. Y'all about ready to run laps while ago. You're getting quiet on me now. Second Timothy. Guys, you got that in the back? Second Timothy. I'll, I'll turn there if you don't have it. Second Timothy. Chapter 4. 
I want to begin in verse number three. Can you back it up one? There we go. For the time will come when they will not endure, watch this, sound doctrine. There's going to come a time. Now watch this. This was not written to the world. This is not written to the culture. This is written to God's people. And he said the time is going to come. This is Paul writing, talking to his spiritual son, Timothy. He said, the time is going to come, Timothy, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they just want to have their ears tickled. And they will accumulate for themselves. And you can do that with social media now. You can find whoever you want to agree with whatever you say. And there's enough bending and uh, and twisting scriptures to validate whatever you think. But they will will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. But look what he says in verse number 4. And turn away their ears from the truth. And they'll start turning to the myths, which is the same thing as a lie. That means that doctrine, watch this now, biblical truth. I'm trying to teach and preach at the same time. Biblical truth will not always be celebrated. But it must be endured. You have to learn how to endure Doctrine in a crazy world. When sound doctrine, watch this now, is not endured, we produce churches that are designed. Watch this now, because when the river is not flowing out of the churches, now the churches have to compensate by being cool. We got to get more smoke machines because we can't create the real glory, so we got to get an artificial glory. <laughs> So, so, so we have to design our churches, and I'm not against any of that. Y'all know we got all that going on. We preached on all that stuff. But churches now are designed around being cool, and their messages are designed around life skills, self-help, positive attitudes, and how to be happy, and how can we get you in and get you out at a good hour. When there's no water, when there's no river, when there's no life of God flowing through the sanctuary, Now we have to make everything artificial. (laughs) Huh? Now now everything has to be mechanical. Everything has to be made up. We have to to dim the light so you'll worship because we don't want nobody to see you worship. (laughs) It's getting quiet up in this house. But everything becomes so mechanical And there's nothing wrong. We do all those things. I'm not against those things. As long as the river's flowing, you can drink your coffee in here. I don't care. As long as the river's moving, you can can worship God however you want to worship God when you go. It don't matter. You can can have a, a, a Dunkin' Donut in one hand and a latte in the other hand. I don't care. I want the river moving. But when the river's not moving then we begin to fabricate the anointing. We begin to downgrade the authority of the power of God. And we, get, and we just try to appease people to make people feel happy rather than trying to get people to be holy. Because there's a difference between being happy and being holy. Holiness puts you close to God. Happiness deals with the emotional realm that can change under the circumstances. Push on somebody and tell them, revive us again, Lord, revive us. So, so, so the role of the church now, watch this, because if we don't endure, he said the time's going to come and they will not endure sound doctrine. Then what they do is they turn from the truth. Come on, that's going on in our culture. They're turning from the truth and they're paying attention to myths. Now, I don't have time to keep breaking all this down. I definitely don't have time today. But here, here's a couple myths. People are born gay. It's a myth. People are born gay. That's a lie. Your culture has taught you not to respond. See, culture has taught you because when you say that, you offend people who are struggling with that. Jesus will offend your mind to reveal your heart. That's a myth. You're born gay. There is no gay gene ever found with all the hundreds and thousands of research hours. Because if there's a gay gene, there's probably going to be, this is what Dr. Carol and I were talking about the other day, there's going to be a fornication gene. 
How about an adulterer gene? How about a kidnapping gene? I was born to kidnap kids. I was born to have incest. Huh? Well, Jesus never said anything against homosexuality. That's true. From the red recorded writings of Jesus, he never said one thing about homosexuality. But he never said anything about rape. He never said anything about incest. He never said anything about child abuse. But we know those things are wrong. Everybody knows they're wrong. But what happens is when the church begins to deviate from truth, the myths, the lies, because it's so popular in culture, it gets accepted into the church. And that's when the water begins to dry up. Because Ezekiel said, I saw some water, and it started out from the temple, and it started ankle deep. But the further it went, the deeper it got. Can I just tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? I hope we're somewhere in the middle. I hope we're somewhere where the water has started to flow. But I'm not satisfied with knee-deep water. I'm not satisfied with ankle-deep water. I'm not satisfied with waist-deep water. I want waters that I can swim in. I want to be so much in God that God is in me, and you can't tell the difference. So the purpose of doctrine is to teach, to instruct, right? So the role of the church, I'm just going to have to quit here because we don't have the time, but the role of the, ter- the church is to teach doctrine, not give you myths. It's to teach and to raise a standard, not to give you some po- a, a, a few poems and a few life skills. I shouldn't have to waste my time as a preacher telling you where to put your buggy back when you're through shopping at Walmart. I shouldn't be telling you when somebody walks up to you and sticks their hand out for a handshake, you shake their hand. Those are life skills. I shouldn't have to tell you, say thank you when somebody gives you something. <laughs> Those are life skills. That, that, how many know that the gospel is deeper than that? And so now, 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 now we got all this mixture. Come on now, walk, walk with me. Now that we got all this compromise in the church, nobody knows what a Christian looks like. Now that we got so much compromise, come on, that's what happened in Ezekiel's day. When they began to turn their hearts away from the commandments and the statutes of God, God says, that's okay, I'll just pull back my power, I'll pull back my protection, and I'll let your enemies come in there. They'll raid you, they'll rob you, they'll pull you off into exile, and they'll keep you there. They'll keep a whole generation there. I'll let you stay there for 70 years until you begin to turn your heart back because God will wait. He let the children of Israel walk in the desert for 40 years, he wouldn't move by their complaining. He wouldn't move by because they didn't want to do nothing. He just said, if that's the way you want to live, then I'll give exactly what you want. I'll let you live in your confinements and your restrictions. I'll let you live below the power that I have invested in you. But can I tell you, God help the church. Let there be a generation that rises that says, we don't want to just live in ankle deep water. We want a move of God that begins to saturate every city and every town and every village. We'll push on somebody and tell them it's going to happen now. Let, let, me, go, let me go one more scripture here. Guys, I, skip, skip Titus chapter 1. Go to 2 John chapter 1. 2 John chapter 1. Guys in the back, if you throw that up there real quick. 2 John chapter 1 says, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but the way but that you may receive A full reward. Verse number 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide. Now watch these words. Does not abide in the teaching of Christ. It's the same word for doctrine. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the doctrines of Christ does not have God. Whoo. Come on, where's the church at? And the one who abides in the teaching, the doctrine, he has both the Father and the Son. I didn't say that. Your Bible says that. When you don't abide, that word abide literally means, it's it's the word uh, maneo, it means to remain in. It's not that you don't stumble, it's just that you don't get out of it. You keep working in it. If you remain in the teachings of God, the doctrines of Christ, 
then you have God. Woo. Maybe this is too heavy for this sanctified bunch on a Sunday morning. I'm just trying to help the church understand until we curve the compromise and the mixture going on in the house of God, our prayer meetings are futile. Our worship is in vain. Because God doesn't just want to just give me a little bless me service. God wants a people that are rising up and holding to the standard of his word until he begins to shake the heavens and the earth and there is a move of God flowing into every neighborhood that we are, per, are, are placed in, however you want to say that. Amen. So here's the problem. Now watch this. Let me, let me just get where I'm going. We're going to go. Pastor Porter, you guys can come on. I need to quit. Paul writing to Timothy said the difficult days are coming. That's in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said difficult days are coming and there will be those who are haters of good. Somebody shout haters of good. In other words, Timothy, the time will come when even Christians will start behaving badly. That's in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In other words, Timothy, you got to be on guard. And ladies and gentlemen, we are living in an hour right now just, those guys, they all going up on the stage here in a minute. Y'all just, <laughs> in case y'all didn't know, they're going to walk out on it. Usually they go over there, but we got some stuff going on in that room. They can't go that way, so they're going this way. So let, let them get in there. and They're going to they're come right up here and then a single file line, and they're going to get in here. <laughs> just, just in case y'all, like, what, what's going on? They're they, they just moving. He said the day will come when they'll begin to exchange the truth for a lie. But he said, you are to do what is good. You got to do what is right. That word good is the same thing that we would translate into righteousness. You got to do what is righteous. In a world that has gone crazy, you need to hold the standard. In a world that has lost its mind and chaos is everywhere, you have to hold the standard. So I don't know if I can do that. You can by the power of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling power of the Holy Spirit can keep you. Once you became born again, I'm about finished with this first part, and then we'll, we'll see where it goes. Once you become born again, you're separated, or you separate yourself from the world. And you have to practice doing what is good. So it means I just can't have sex outside of marriage because it feels good. I can't keep texting somebody else's wife. Come on. I can't just keep using that language that I got saved from. I can't just keep drinking to get a buzz on. Those that are more mature in here, you ought to be amen to me like crazy right now because there's some folks in here that are struggling with that. You ought to be like throwing books and Bibles right about now because you ought to say, that's right. That's the word of God. Right. You got to help create the atmosphere because we're still at ankle deep water. We got to get the river moving. And, and what, watch this. If we, if we don't hold to a standard and create it, then the, the cultures out there will keep trickling in here. Don't judge it by the day. We got tons of people on vacation. Don't judge it by the day. I'm just telling you, those cultures will keep coming in here, and we'll just keep giving in. We'll just keep compromising, and we'll just keep giving a little mixture here, a little mixture. We'll say, well, it's so God, honey. God loves you. And yeah, God loves you, but he does not approve of your sin because God cannot keep approving of the sin that's going on in your life and expect to have a river flowing out of his house. There has to be a culture established in the ranks of God's authority where people gather together and we know what it is to love God. We know what it is to do what is right. We know what it is to do good in a hostile culture that's against our faith. We know what it is. If you practice doing good, which translates living righteously, then, then the myths and the lies don't take root because I'm living by a different standard. This is where I'm going to close just for today. When believers don't stand on truth, then we start embracing the views of society. 
Watch this one word, and it's going to trigger it. Ready? We start embracing the views of society, which is tolerance. Tolerance makes a mockery of the cross. Tolerance demands that we affirm that all views are equally valid, and they are not. That's right. Come on. And what happens is when we start embracing the views of tolerance, it becomes the view of relativism, which denies that there's any fixed truth because everything becomes relative. Whatever works for you is true for you. Now we have a society that pressures us into, watch, being non-judgmental and tolerant. Now you got preachers that are afraid to say anything because we don't want to offend nobody because we got to embrace everything. No, you embrace people at any level or degree of sin. It, it, it's not a people problem, it's a sin problem. And Jesus did not come to accommodate the culture. He came as a movement against the culture. The very fact that he was crucified is the evidence that he didn't go with the culture. He said, you heard it say, but now I say. In other words, he began to present a different mindset of thinking because you've heard it this way. That's the flow of the culture. Culture always moves one way, but Jesus came and said, you're going this way, but here's what I, here's, here's what I say. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go against the grain. I want you to go against the culture. You heard it say, you shall not commit murder, but I say unto you, if you hate your brother, you have already committed murder. Because it's, 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 it's you got to go against the counter of, you got to be the counter of the culture. And anytime, what, I'm, just, I'm trying to help our church understand. Anytime somebody gets offended and you take it up with a person, a, a preacher like me, you are missing out on what God's trying to reveal in your heart. Because if, if, if anybody, we should not go out to offend people, but Romans chapter 9 says that Jesus is the rock of offense. Jesus is a stumbling block to the disobedience. You're not getting offended at me. You're getting offended over truth. It's the truth of God that's connecting with your heart. That's why we have to make decisions. Right. And so when the truth of God begins to connect with your heart, don't put it to a face. Put it to what God is saying. If it's God's word, then God is convicting my heart to a different level. Yes. Tell somebody to revive us again. Because we've heard things like now, you know, well, God loves everybody. Well, sure he does. Nobody never said he didn't. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse number 17, for God, not, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God loves everybody. We're not talking about God's love for people. But understand, love is not the same thing as agreement. Right. Love is not the same thing as permission. <laughs> love is not the same thing as approval. Right. God loves everybody, but he don't agree with everybody. People go to hell not because God don't love them. People go to hell because they don't love God enough to change. Amen? So I'm just telling, because they, they use words like tolerance. You know, you got to be tolerant. I love everybody. But I'm not tolerant of any lifestyle that's against the word of God. Well, don't judge me. Y'all ever heard that? Judge not lest you be judged. Well, that's a cop out. People use that as a way to to thwart the responsibility to make a decision. Anytime people don't want to make a decision on an issue, they throw out words like, who are you to judge me? We cannot judge the intrinsic value of a person to God. We don't judge people's hearts like that. But I can judge the fruit of your life. 
People say, don't judge me. You ever heard of, anybody, anybody ever said that to you? I'm getting real quiet in here. I'm going to quit here in a minute so y'all can go home, eat you some Popeyes. Don't judge me. And the thing about, we make judgments all day long. You don't let your kids play with everybody, do you? Are you judging? Yes, you are. You're judging. <laughs> you don't eat it at the same restaurant all the time, do you? Are you judging? If you're a boss and you own a company, when you hire and fire people, are you judging? You better believe it. We make judgments all day long. So the world says, well, you can't judge people. No, we're not judging the intrinsic value and the worth of a person to God. That's not what we're judging. But we can judge the lifestyle that you're trying to portray. That's why the church has to have a standard. That's why the church has to have a place in their hearts with God that when we do blow it, when we do sin, because we will, but we come back to the heart of the Father so we can keep the river at a steady pace so yeah. that we don't keep letting mixture compromise. That's why we got to be revived again. That's why we need to be born again. That's why we need to move movements of God again. Come on, just get up on your feet and give God a praise. Come on, just begin to thank him like you know he's worthy to be praised. Come on. You're worthy, worthy, worthy. Hallelujah. Come on, just Hallelujah. praise him. Just praise him. Come on. Come on, we're just not going to live according to mixture. We're not going to live according to compromise. God, we thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Let me just let me let me finish with this right here. This I was trying to get to this. I got about three pages left to get to this, but I'm gonna get to this right here. I was doing some research. This is where this this like lit me up. Because I'm I, I feel the weight of the sin in our culture. If you don't feel it, then you can't deal with it. I feel it. And, and I'm not talking about the world's sin. I, I, I that that I am anointed to bust that up. I'm anointed to deal with the world, okay? I'm anointed to deal with culture. Culture does not intimidate me, okay? But, but, but the issue, it's not the world to me. The issue is always the church. And so I feel the weight of that because I want the movement of God so electrifying that when people drive on our property, the hair on their Come neck on, stands Patrick. up. Come on. Yeah. I'm telling you. You say, is that possible? Oh, I'm about to show you how possible it is. Yeah. I, I believe you can be so full of God that, that, that even in our, in our small corporate gatherings like this, the presence of God can rise. The river of God can rise so deep that when people come in here, they may, they may have not even come in here not knowing what they're about to step into, but they get lost in the river. Next thing you know, they're just spinning around. They're just being tossed. they my God, what is that? My, I see healing. I see that. I mean, they just, they just spinning in the river of God. So I'm, I've, been, I've been looking, I've been praying, I've been studying, I've been researching, I've been doing all these things that I have to do. And I said, God, I, I, I live in America, so my nation is America. <laughs> I want America to be saved, okay? That's where I live. Amen. And, 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 and I've always thought that as goes America, so goes the world. And that was true in my belief and my thinking until I came across these stats, okay? Y'all got like three minutes? Yes. This is going to bless you so much. America has always been the leader of Christianity around the world. It's been that way for the last century. It's been that way for the last 100 years. But Christianity, this, this is what the researchers have come up with, and I'll give you the numbers in a minute. They say Christianity does not stand or fall with America. I don't want to lose it in America, but that doesn't mean it's going to go to waste if America don't rise up. Because they went on to say, when you look at the wider global picture, Christianity is more alive and well around the world than it has been in any other time in the history of mankind. Christianity around the world is growing at an unprecedented rate. Thank you, Lord. Here's the numbers. According to the Center of Study for Global Christianity, the numbers of Christians in Africa, watch this, is increasing at a rate of 2.81% per year. Now watch this. 
That may not mean or sound like a lot, but the compounding effect gets huge. Watch this. In 1900, there were about 9.5 million Christians on the dark continent of Africa. By 1970, that had risen to over 140 million. Today, in Africa, that number is nearly 685 million born-again believers in Africa, which is twice the population of America. Wow. There's, there's, there's double, not, I'm not talking about Christians in America, I'm talking about the whole population of America, 360-something million people, right? Africa has more Christians in its nation than America does having people. Wow, come on. In Asia, Christianity is growing. Watch the numbers. At 1.5% per year, with over 100 million more Christians than North America. By 2030, watch this. What's that? Uh, Nine years from now, right? (laughs) Right? Oh, let me see. (laughs) By 2030, it is estimated that there will be more Christians in communist China than in America. Wow. You know China where they can't worship God. You know China where it's under a dictator. You know China where they can't come and they can't even preach the Bible openly. In nine more years, there's going to be more Christians in China than there are in America. And that, that's, that's, with, that's, that's going along with all the persecution but because they can't really figure out how many because there's a lot of them that, that, that they, they can't get to because of the persecution. These are just the numbers that they have hardcore numbers on. Thank you for your excitement. Okay. Okay. Okay, what about the Muslim world? Okay. There are movements of discipleship that are taking place in the Muslim world more rapidly than the history of our entire world historical facts on Christianity. This is what they're saying. In fact, the fastest growing branch of the church worldwide in the world is in Iran. Mm. This is what what one Iranian uh, Christian described his situation. He's still in Iran today. This is what he said. He said, what if I told you Islam is dead? What if I told you that the mosques are empty inside of Iran? What if I told you no one follows Islam inside of Iran? Would you believe me? Because this is exactly what is happening inside of Iran. God is moving powerfully inside of Iran. Thank you, Lord. You see that? You're not going to get that on your news because that's just going to promote hatred and division and racism and all this stuff. But I'm going to tell you, this Christian is there. He said, the, the, the mosques are empty in Iran. There ain't nobody worshiping Muhammad in Iran. Christianity, Jesus Christ, because the church is alive. The church is awakened to the God possibilities. I'm just telling you, if God can do it over there in all these countries that don't have what we have, I believe he can do it right here. If nowhere else, God do it on the southwest corner of Lake Okeechobee. Do it right here at New Harvest Church. Come on, if you believe that, give God a praise. Come on, just begin to praise him like he can move in your family, move in my generation. I'm not going to hide myself in a shell and just or a hole. I'm telling you, I'm believing the revival is coming back to the church. I believe God's about to revive us again, and we're going to see the moves of God even in our own land. There's too many remnants. There's too many believers who have sowed, who have prayed, who have been fasting for this movement. Amen. I'll give you this last one, and then we'll go, I promise. John G. Lake. He's passed on now. He was, this is back in his day. He spent five years in South Africa. He planted 625 churches, raised up 1,250 preachers, and had over 100,000 
new converts and had countless documented miracles. This all happened in five years in Africa. He moved back to U.S., to the U.S., to Spokane, Washington. He started a healing school. And within five years in that healing school, he had over 100,000 documented, recorded healings. Five years. The government got so nervous. The government got so curious that they began to run in an investigation. They began to find out what are these healing rooms all about. And then they came back with their report. And this is what the U.S. government said about the findings that they found in Spokane, Washington with John G. Lake in the miracles. They said this, I didn't put it on the screen, but this is what they said. Reverend Lake, through divine healing, has made Spokane, Washington, the healthiest city in the world, according to the United States statistics. Come on. That's right. Wow. Let it be here. Let it be here. Wouldn't it be something if the government confirmed what God's already doing? I'm just telling you, if God can do it in Spokane, Washington, whew, he can do it right here in the glades. Why can't we be the healthiest city? Come on, sugar town. Come on, America's sweetest town. Why don't we be renowned for revival? Why don't we become known for the movements and the outpouring of God? Come it can on. happen. It can happen. It can happen. I'm going to let you go because you look really tired. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I just, I'm just, I, I, I know this probably, ain't a, you probably shouldn't preach this when everybody's on vacation. I'm not preaching to people. I'm preaching to an atmosphere. Come on. That's right. That's I'm right. preaching to an atmosphere because 25% of the people ain't here at any given time. So we're just going to keep on saying it until we get it. Amen. That's right. Look at somebody Amen. next to you and say, Lord, we need to be revived. Come on, Lord, we need to be revived. Come on, we need to be revived so my home can begin to move yeah. in the things of God. I need my children to move in the things of God. I don't know if you own a business. You need to be revived in your business. Your business needs to be set apart so that you can begin to make movements towards the things of God. Yeah. Amen. So hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands all over the building. We're praying. Father, Father, that's our heart's cry. Lord, that you would revive us out of being lethargic. Hallelujah. I'm just using my words that probably don't make sense to a whole lot of people. But Lord, bring us out of a comatose state. Bring us out of a place of sleeping. Let us be awakened to what is already being done literally around the world. Lord, these are not fabricated numbers. These are hard stats that the Spirit of God is moving across the world. Lord, may you move in our hearts. May you move in our land. May you move in our families, move in my children, move in my marriage, move in my relationships, move like you've never moved before. And Lord, we thank you and we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody together said amen. 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 Will you just high five somebody and hug them really good on your way out and tell them I'm so glad you came. We'll see you next Sunday in Jesus' name. God bless you.